false liability claims, theft, and property damage can cost an organization millions of dollars. High-definition surveillance solutions help address the issue by providing irrefutable evidence and deterring criminals. But what if instead of simply reducing theft, damage, and liability, you could stop it before it happens? That's the idea behind implementing an end-to-end -end surveillance system that combines intelligent video analytics and high-def surveillance. Hello, and welcome to this live webcast titled Analytics in HD, Harnessing the Power of Intelligent Video Analytics and HD Surveillance, brought to you by Avigilon and IDG. My name is Tom Schmidt, Managing Editor for IDG Strategic Marketing Services, and I'll be the moderator for this webcast. Joining me is Saskia Battersby, Senior Product Manager for Analytics at Avigilon. Saskia is responsible for the development and execution of the product roadmap for Avigilon's video content analysis solutions. She has over 10 years of experience in analytics product management. Welcome, Saskia. Thank you, Tom. Also joining, great. Also joining me is Willem Ryan, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Avigilon. Willem oversees Avigilon's global product marketing strategy, and he has more than 10 years of experience in the video surveillance industry. Hello, Willem. Hi, Tom. Before we get started, a quick word about this webcast. We are live and interactive today. We welcome your questions and feedback and urge you to take part as much as possible. You may participate in two ways. First, this webcast features audience poll questions. When a poll question appears on your screen, click on the answer that seems right to you and press the Submit button. We'll tally and discuss the results instantly. Second, you can ask questions of our speakers by typing them in the Q&A box on your screen and then pressing the Submit button. We'll do our best to answer your questions during the Q&A segment of the webcast. If we can't answer your question then, we'll get back to you with an answer within a few days. Also, if you haven't already, please make sure to turn off your pop-up blockers. We've got a great session lined up for you today, and you can see here what we plan to cover. We'll start out with what we call the attention span problem. Then we'll move on to video analytics and the types of video analytics that are out there. Next, we'll discuss the rise of high-definition video, and finally, high-def video analytics. But before Saskia takes us deeper into video analytics, we're going to dive right into our first audience poll question. And the question is, what problems do you hope to solve with video analytics? And your choices are, A, prevent theft and vandalism, B, retail analytics, for example, people counting or insight into store activities, C, facial recognition. D, license plate recognition. E, uh, not quite sure yet. So you can go ahead and click on the answers that seem right for you and press the submit, submit button. And it's okay to pick more than one answer in this poll. So if there are various answers that apply, go ahead and tick those off. We'll tally the results in just a few moments. So again, what problems do you hope to solve with video analytics? A, prevent theft and vandalism. B, retail analytics. C, facial recognition, D, license plate recognition, or E, you're not quite sure yet. While we're waiting, Saskia, I'm a little curious. Where do you think most companies are when it comes to, to video analytics? Well, I think all of these um, are pertinent in the analytics space. I think um, preventing theft and vandalism is probably um, the more prominent one as it applies to all industries and, and, and all customers, I, I would say. Um, but I'm curious to see the results uh, for this audience. All righty. And let's see where we are. So what problems do you hope to solve with video analytics? It looks like 68.4% are saying prevent theft and vandalism. 33.9% retail analytics. Facial recognition, 34.5%. License plate recognition, 32 Not sure yet pulls up the rear with 21. Very interesting. Nice division of, uh, of answers. What do you think? Uh, what do you think, Saskia? Yeah, it's, it's, it's as I expected, and I'm uh, glad to see the, the high interest in preventing theft and vandalism, given this is the topic for today. And for those you know, not yet sure or didn't tick that off, hopefully this session will help uh, enlighten the opportunity that analytics has uh, for, for that. Terrific. So let's get underway with today's presentation. How can video analytics help prevent crime? Thanks, Tom. And I want to thank everyone for joining today on behalf of myself, Willem, and, and the Vigilon crew here. I'm looking forward to uh, sharing what we have around analytics. 
So as the poll question mentioned uh, around theft and vandalism and the focus here, we're really talking about enabling uh, crime prevention. And we see uh, HD, effective HD analytics solutions as having three core uh, capabilities that will help prevent crime. Uh, the first is really a low po false positive rate, so that being able to alert the operator to an incident that they need to take action on. A uh, second one is around it being simple and fast to install. There's lots of total cost of ownership or challenges around complex solutions, and I'll get through that. And then finally, the power of high definition and how that exposes uh, a great way to see actually what the I issue is. So those are the pieces we're going to go through today. When you think of uh, video surveillance historically, the point of it has really been around recorded evidence. So really, how do I capture what's happened uh, and be able to use that evidence to prosecute the perpetrator or use it to identify what's happened? It hasn't really been that much used or, or successful in, in active prevention. And really the challenge there is um, it's really around attention span. So if you want to prevent the crime and not just record it, you need an operator or someone or a guard to be able to be alerted to uh, an incident they need to take action in, in prevention. But one of the challenges there, and this is a great quote, a wealth of information creates a poverty of, of attention, is really the amount of information people are inundated with. Um, this could be when you think of a guard monitoring hundreds of, of live video streams. It could be yourself in your personal life, uh, you know, constantly bombarded with emails or other uh, alerts on your phone. We're constantly, our attention is constantly pulled away to think of other things. Uh, and, and really, there have even been studies around this, and they've found that when they uh, did a study of operators or, or people working on specific tasks, it's, it's quite repetitive, um, that the human attention span was about 20 minutes. And you may be thinking, 20 minutes, who can pay attention to something repetitive that's 20 minutes? I mean, that's certainly how I felt when I heard this initially. Uh, and, and certainly there's a degradation or, or a drop off in that 20 minute time frame. But you might also be wondering if people can't watch a video screen and monitor, a guard can't monitor 20 minutes of live video, how could they sit through uh, a two hour movie? And, and so really what is important to recognize is there's a difference between passively monitoring something that's repetitive and, and watching something that's engaging and interesting like, like your favorite movie. And really what has happened is our minds have evolved to ignore repetitive stimuli. I, I think of when car alarms first came into existence, every time we heard one, we would turn and look and say, is that car being broken into? You know, curious to see what's happening. I don't know that I personally go and prevent the crime, but, but maybe. Um, but over time, that, that's, uh, hearing that repetitive stimuli, I think most people ignore it. Similarly, if you are living near a busy roadway, that repetitive noise of the road will become uh, lost to you and you won't hear it over time. Um, but a friend may come to visit and wonder how you can stand to live there. And that's because our minds have, have developed the capability to fil filter out these stimuli uh, to allow us to focus on what's interesting and, and not become overwhelmed with the information. And so as part of that, the study concluded um, was performed on operators, uh, so these are guards or people in the military, and they found that really there's, a, uh, as I said, a decline in your attention span over time. So by 20 minutes, you're pretty much tuned out, but it actually starts much earlier. So if you're watching a screen, you're going to tune out, you know, minutes into that. And, and they also found that poor quality of video really accelerates that. If you can't see much from the video, you can imagine your attention span would be lost. And if you're trying to monitor multiple uh, screens, again, there's that level of distraction that causes challenges. So this principle of, of a guard watching a video screen and not being able to pay attention is really what um, uh, was a key idea that, that resulted in the development of analytics. So how can I bring information to the operator's attention so that they can take action on it versus expecting them to say, uh, sit there and be attentive uh, while nothing happens effectively in the video. So 
really this is um, the intention with analytics is really to focus only on those important alerts. So bring that operator to the, uh, their attention. Here's something that needs to take place. Um, this is a scene where something's happening. You need to come in and look at it. Um, but the key there is that I don't bring forward everything that could be distracting or, or not um, of interest, and I allow them to focus on things that are important. And this really frees up the operator to focus on those issue, uh, particular incidents and not have to, um, and it addresses the challenge of them monitoring maybe multiple sites or multiple screens by bringing those things forward. But in that world of analytics, it's been around for, for quite a long time, as many of you may know, there's a lot of different forms of, of motion analytics. Um, there's what you know, we might call frame differencing, so basic video motion detection. Um, there's advanced video motion detection, which is an improvement on that, which is really about calibrating and understanding the background, and then pattern modeling, and that's what we'll talk about at the end. But just to start from the beginning, frame differencing. So this is really the idea that between any two frames in a video, if something's moving, those pixels or the, the um, image will change from frame to frame. Uh, it's a very, it's very uh, standard and I, and I would think in most cameras today you could find basic video motion detection. So here you see I'm just detecting scene to scene that uh, the individual in the scene has moved. And this works quite well. Uh, you can imagine in an indoor environment, at night you set up, set up video motion, presumably uh, you're, you're indoors, so the person who comes in is someone that you want to take action on. Maybe that's the cleaner that had come in at a different hour than you expected, or maybe that's the perpetrator uh, robbing your premises. And so it tends to work very well in these what we, we call sterile, static environments where any motion is something of interest. So if you think of deploying that in an outdoor scenario where you could have leaves moving, you could have um, motion from the trees causing uh, shadows to move, uh, other things happening in the scene, it would pick those up and so it would get a very high false alarm rate. And like with that car alarm analogy, uh, if that alarm is going off all the time, the operator tends to ignore it. So you would miss the time when actually now there's a perpetrator entering your property versus the time when it was a cat or the leaves moving or what have you. So while well, it does help reduce the attention span problem over time uh, as those alarms come up uh, quite often being false, people tend to just ignore the entire um, feedback from the system. So some improvements were made uh, and advanced video motion detection was developed. And here this is around understanding uh, the, the background, so going out and calibrating and understanding the scene that you're in uh, and, and being able to set this up and then anything that's not considered background is, and is moving is an object you want to detect. Now this is great if your background scene doesn't change. Um, you know, it can get a, quite a decent accuracy, but as we know, trees change in the seasons, um, you know, there may be some changes to the background uh, in the neighboring building and you'd have to constantly come out and recalibrate. So while this does improve the results initially, you can see that over time it does struggle to keep that attention span. And um, you know, that recalibration and, and resetting up the system can be cumbersome, or, and we'll get to the details of that uh, later, but uh, that can cause the system to become uh, prone to false alarms over time. And they tend to work really well in the first weeks after it's been set up, and then that, that confidence level or the accuracy tends to degrade and, and it needs to be worked on to improve it. So the third uh, type of analytics is, is around pattern modeling, so advanced video pattern detection. And here the premise is, is quite different. So in the previous case, we modeled and understood the background, and anything that wasn't in the background that was in the foreground we detected, and that seems you know, at least to me, I would think that that's how you, you would expect the technology to work. But um, some smart folks came up with an idea of saying, well, let's, instead of trying to understand the background that could be changing, I mean, in this scene you see the water moving in the background, you know, there could be changes to the environment. Why don't we work on having the system actually understand what you're looking for? So, you know, even a child can look at this uh, scene of a man running down the beach with his dog and, um, and understand, well, that's the dog and that's the person. And we've done that over time, not because as humans we've developed the ability to understand what's background and foreground, it's because we recognize the movement. 
we recognize the characteristics. This person is standing up. They have uh, two legs, two arms. They're moving at this certain uh, way and rhythm. And we can distinguish that from a dog who's running on the ground. And that, basically that principle uh, is really what video pattern detection is, is about, being able to understand that in that scene I can pick out the person because I understand how they move and I understand that object and I have a strong understanding of the object that I want to detect instead of having to understand every scene, every background that I'm in. And that strong ability to detect it has a lot of benefits. Um, if you imagine a scene like this one here, um, I'm, you know, it's a rainy scene, there's snow, there's lots of things in the environment that would have changed. And really, even as an operator, it's hard to look into the scene and detect the person. So there is a person in there. Look closely into your screen. Uh, you know, I do, we do this in a presentation uh, on the stage. Most people actually can't pick them out. And honestly, the first time I saw this, now I know where it is, so I cheat a little bit. But um, there's the person sitting in the scene. And so with pattern, because it understands the movement and the behavior, it's able to actually pick up the person even faster than an operator would who was attentive to the scene. And you can imagine um, if they weren't attentive, the likelihood that they would notice there was a person in there would be low. And that's because it's picking up that movement, understanding those characteristics versus trying to uh, ignore the rain and ignore the other elements. It's actually looking for what it wants to detect. And that's a, basically a, a strong difference in paradigm there. And if it does that through uh, the use of, of um, it does that through the use of understanding how objects move and detect. And in many cases, that could be understanding people, it could be understanding vehicles. So it can focus on those primary objects that cause concern and require an action. So it's not going to be able to detect whether that person is up to a criminal activity per se, but it is going to be able to bring that object forward in an alarm and the operator can look at it and say, well, do I need to take action? Is that person up to no good? Uh, or are they, you know, there by design and, and so we're fine with it. And so we find that when a technology based on pattern detection is used, the false alarm rate is very low and therefore the operator knows that when something comes up they have to take action. And even if that action is to say, oh, that's Joe and he's on the property as expected, I'm still attentive because I still had to make that decision. I still had to use my uh, uh, capabilities as a, as a guard or operator to take some action on it um, versus if it was coming up with leaves all the time, that would be, be really a distraction, but I still can make that decision. So I'm engaged in the tool and we find that attention span uh, is quite well maintained. So this is covering one aspect, and this is, the goal here again is really about reducing those false alarms so the guard can stay attentive and when the issue is raised to them, they know that they have to take action, whatever that action may be. But if that system is complex to set up um, and maintain, there's some really big challenges there. So as I mentioned a bit briefly earlier, traditional video analytics um, that require calibration are very complex to set up. So advanced video motion detection uh, is complicated. You have to have a really strong understanding of the environment. Um, there's a lot of training needed to be able to set this up. Uh, you have to go out and calibrate. And, and as I mentioned, there's ongoing maintenance. I'd have to go and recalibrate as the scene changed, the building behind you changed, was torn down, what have you, the seasons changed. So there's a lot of ongoing maintenance and costs associated with that. So many people would set these systems up and become frustrated and discouraged over time as the false alarm rates escalated because it was a, uh, generally a challenge to maintain. So, so solutions that use self-learning, as we do with our solution here at Avigilon, uh, it, it's you know a smart little creature, if you will, it's, that's inside the technology. It's able to uh, automatically adjust itself and learn from the conditions. So on day one, you can set it up. It can already detect people. It can detect vehicles and distinguish them. But over time, it gets to understand the scene, uh, where objects are in the scene, and, and be able to improve on that. So with that self-learning, it's able to be set up in moments, and then the system learns itself. There's no need to calibrate. There's no concept of calibration whatsoever. Uh, which really improves the setup time. And now when you take that and you couple that idea of I'm going to go and learn the scene with the operator being able to provide feedback, so in some cases it will still be in a scene that there's going to be false alarms, that, that, that just happens, that's the nature of analytics. 
But if an operator can provide feedback to the, to the system and say, well, that's actually a false alarm, it can adjust its understanding of the scene and reduce those false alarms in the future. So over time, the system becomes more and more refined and the false alarm rates become uh, very low and it's, it's very accurate, um, both from the self-learning and from the uh, teaching. And that really helps to focus again on bringing just the right uh, uh, images or, or, or alerts forward to the operator. So the, the low false alarm rate and the simple fast to install are, are key case characteristics, but there's another aspect here that can't be forgotten, uh, and that's really around high definition. So the key premise here being how can you act on what you can't see? And I'm going to hand it over to Willem now to talk to you about our HD capabilities, or to talk about generally about HD. Thanks, Askia, and that was an outstanding uh, overview of um, our, the analytics uh, technology. And uh, this is a key, key question in terms of how can you act on what you can't see, because it really comes down to having the evidence to be able to then take the proper action. And this macro trend in our uh, security uh, industry is really about the rise of high definition. And I want to really go into some of the specifics about high definition video, how that plays uh, with analytics to provide a really powerful end-to-end -end solution. But before we do that, I'm going to hand it back over uh, to Tom, and we're going to have our second uh, poll question um, activity. Exactly. Thanks, Willem. And uh, that second question is, does your organization currently have a high-definition surveillance system in place? And your choices are A, yes, an HD system, B, yes, an HD and standard-definition hybrid system, C, no, we have a standard-definition system, D, no system at all, or E, I'm not sure. Again, you can go ahead and click on the answer that seems right for you and press the Submit button. We'll tally the results in just a few minutes. So, Willem, I'll, I'll ask you, as I ask, ask you, what are you seeing in the market today? Where do you think most companies are with uh, uh, moving to high def? I think we're in a transition phase, and uh, I would assume that uh, many of our listeners today uh, have a, a combination or a hybrid system um, as they move from either a, a pure analog to uh, a digital system, uh, or if they had a digital system with standard definition, they're beginning to install higher definition. And so I, I think we're seeing that in the, in the market trends. Got it. Got it. Okay. Let's give this just a couple more seconds. And... Uh, let's see. I think we have a good turnout today, so we're uh, we're uh, pushing the system a little bit. Excellent. Okay. Does your organization currently have a high def surveillance system in place? Uh, interesting breakdown. HD system, yes, twenty eight point six percent. Yes, HD and standard def, 33.7. No, we have a standard definition, definition system, 20.1%. No system at all, 10.6. Not sure, 7%. You pretty much called it, Willem. What do you think? Yeah, and this is uh, consistent, although I would say the, the, the people that say they have a, a high def system, um, that's increasing. And we, you know, we see that with um, uh, our own um, partners and, and our uh, Salesforce, uh, more and more people are converting to HD. And to see that number grow um, to you know, this particular poll to 28% mm -hmm. uh, is, is a positive thing. And i uh, be happy to talk a little bit more about why we, we are seeing that. Terrific. So, Willem, take us on a deeper dive into high-definition surveillance. Okay. So, another study um, that we've seen, and this really backs up uh, some of your um, uh, feedback here from your poll questions uh, answers, is the growth of IP. So, the fact is, and most of you know this on the call, we're in a, a, a transition phase um, within the industry. Uh, we're now currently um, 50% of all systems going out the door this year are, are going to be uh, IP systems. You talk to certain people, it might be a little bit more than that. Um, but we are at the tipping point where most systems going out today um, are now IP. IP. And um, we've moved from that pure analog or uh, majority analog base 
uh, to a digital um, system. And that's important just because when analytics first came out, we have to realize analytics was within mostly an analog uh, environment. And then even when it went to IP, it was definitely in standard definition. So analytics was working with older technology um, in terms of the video capabilities. But another interesting point to consider is the uh, breakdown of the actual IP cameras being sold out the door. So I said around 50% um, out the door going to be uh, digital versus analog. But even more interestingly is the fact that most of those cameras today are now going to be in a megapixel resolution. And uh, megapixel means at least a million pixels. And going out the door um, in high definition rather than standard. And so we see quite an interesting trend from the IMS research that by uh, 2016, uh, we're going to see the lion's share uh, of all digital cameras um, being uh, sold are going to be high definition. And this is a great thing both just from a video surveillance but also from a um, video analytics standpoint because now really the technology in, in its advanced state along with the capabilities of high definition video are perfectly matched to provide a much more powerful solution than in the past where we had an analog and standard definition uh, video. So let's just look at the concept of why we are moving to megapixel. What, what's the reason? Other than just the, the fact that it's, it's higher definition, um, there are some key principles of um, high definition video that really are moving um, people towards this technology. And so earlier, uh, Saskia made the point that we cannot see what is not captured. Um, and it's impossible to enhance low resolution images. And th this is a key concept because I think a lot from the, the Hollywood um, industry and what we see a lot is the fact that people think that you can enhance, you can somehow clarify um, uh, grainy images. And so somehow there's going to be some CSI um, uh, operator that can take a, a horrible picture, clean it up, and all of a sudden I can see someone's face, I can see someone's license plate. And, and as we know in reality, that is not the case. And so if we have poor image quality going into an analytic system, um, the capabilities of that analytic system in order to properly detect and alert um, are going to be compromised. And moreover, even if we do detect an alert on that, um, the, the fact that we can, can't zoom in and get the details with the standard definition camera is, of course, not going to give us the evidence uh, that we need to take proper action. And so this is really the, the, the key point uh, in terms of why we're moving to high definition. So in terms of just the optics, um, you really had a choice as you create your uh, video surveillance system. You choose the field of view. You either have a wide field of view to capture the, the broadest area, or you have uh, a more telephoto um, view in order to catch more details. And this really hasn't changed. I mean, the, the concepts of imaging don't change from uh, you know, standard definition to high definition. Um, but there are some um, benefits of moving to high definition that help resolve sort of this dilemma that you had to choose from. So let's just take a, a, an example of that. So here we're looking at um, a European football stadium into the stands. And when I look into the stands, of course, even with an analog system, with the proper lens, I can get the, the broad coverage I need of, of the, that area. Um, the challenge happens is when I have to zoom in and try to get some detail. And as we can see here, as soon as I do that with my broad coverage and then I try to digitally zoom, I lose the detail and I can't really see anything uh, of interest. I don't get the evidence I need um, when I zoom in to those particular areas of the screen. Now, if I do the same thing with a high definition camera, the, 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 the great point of high definition is that it gives me the ability to have that broad coverage. And then when I see something of interest, I can zoom in and I can get that detail. And you see that on your screen here, that same image, now I can actually make out the faces. I can make out all the characteristics of that uh, section of um, the field of view. And so really this is what we call in the industry and, and law enforcement and military uh, folks call wide area persistent stare. You want the ability to have situational awareness with that wide area coverage at the same time have that simultaneous ability to zoom in and get the image detail that you need in order to uh, really get the irrefutable evidence 
for um, uh, making the better decision uh, for action. So how does this relate to analytics? Well, what we talked about earlier was the fact that we want to um, detect objects. Now we have the three types. You have just the motion detection, advanced motion detection, and pattern modeling. And high definition, if you can analyze the video in a high definition, you actually have the ability to be more accurate um, and to have um, a greater range of capture because you're analyzing in um, a higher resolution. So you, you're creating a better performance capability of your analytics. And the Avigilon um, analytic technology does analyze in high depth. And of course, you know, with pattern detection, you combine those two things, you're going to have a really low false positive, and you're getting the alarms based on the objects of interest that uh, Saskia talked about. And then finally, once you have that alert, with the high definition video, now that I can zoom in digitally, I can see the details that I need so that I can actually take the proper action. And this combination of both accurate and low false um, uh, alarm rates of pattern um, detection, along with the high definition capability of your video, um, gives you the best of both worlds. And as I mentioned, I think we're finally at a time where both technologies uh, are in our industry and are actually well matched for each other. And, and this is the power of the, the combination that we wanted to um, bring to you today so that you have the ability to understand how to combine them together. And the Vigilon system um, would bring that together both through um, our analytic technology and the broad range of uh, cameras that we provide uh, in high definition. So again, uh, an important key uh, uh, reminder is that the human attention span is about 20 minutes for repetitive tasks. And, and as you take that away, remember that within a security environment, we want to bring forth the, uh, the alerts and the information that they need, not an overabundancy of information, um, but something to address the attention span problem. And the, the three keys to doing that um, to actually enable crime prevention are the low false positives, the simple and fast insulation, and of course combining that with high definition um, technology and analytics will give you the ability um, to have effective uh, video analytic technology to prevent crime. So with that, I want to turn it back to Tom. Thank you for your attention, and we're going to uh, take your questions from here. Exactly. Thanks, Willem. So instead, it's time for the audience QA segment of our, of our webcast, and I strongly encourage you to submit questions in the time we have remaining today. Uh, let's see. It looks like we have a number of interesting questions in the queue. Uh, the first one is, uh, can analytics identify more than just people? I guess I'll, I'll direct that to you, Saskia. Uh, yeah, so uh, as we talked about, we were talking quite a bit about people, but um, certainly with the Vigilant Solution, we focus on detecting people, but also vehicles, so cars, trucks, um, those sorts of objects that come on the scene. It's really about what it's, um, in the case of pattern matching, it's depending on what pattern. In the case, obviously, of standard video motion, it detects anything that moves. So um, the goal there is to just focus it on, on what we consider to be a potential um, thing of interest, which for, for us is people or vehicles. Got it. Okay, next question. Um, what are some specific use cases for analytic solutions? So analytics, as I mentioned earlier, while you could have standard motion detection uh, indoors, a lot of the use cases uh, is around perimeter protection. So in an outdoor scenario, there's a lot more challenges of being able to identify um, when there's a, something of interest uh, coming on a scene. Some use cases we've uh, had a lot of success with uh, at least the technology, um, which was the predecessor video IQ that uh, Vigilon acquired, um, was a lot around perimeter protection in, in remote locations. Um, also, uh, scenarios where you have like a central monitoring, um, central station, or others monitoring an environment, um, and you have the, the need where the guard has to monitor say, a lot of screens or a lot of sites, and by using uh, analytics with a low uh, false positive rate, they're able to monitor many more sites and really optimize their time by alerting them to incidents 
Uh, and, and this isn't just when, when the perpetrator comes on the property, they're actually really good when you can provide it um, in your perimeter area. So as a, an individual approaches the property or um, your asset that you want to protect, if you can alert on that, then you can take action before a crime is actually committed. Got it. Got it. We're discussing video analytics and high-def surveillance with Saskia Battersby and Willem Ryan of Avigilant today. Uh, we encourage you to ask your questions. Next one here. Um, can video analytics replace the need for guards or active monitoring? Interesting question. Yeah, so it's a, often a misconception that we're out to uh, replace all the guards. What really you're trying to do with analytics is bring um, a particular incident or camera or, or frames to the attention of a guard. So a human needs to still decide is this a threat? Is there an action that needs to be taken here? Um, so certainly it's not to replace the guards, but we do find a lot of companies are able to uh, reduce the number of guards on site, maybe reduce the need for the guard to um, walk the perimeter by using the cameras to do the alerting. Uh, they're really able to optimize that investment. But at the end of the day, uh, we as humans, our brains are much more advanced than analytics can ever be, and we need to be able to assess based on the situation and our knowledge of situations, what action we want to take, um, you know, uh -huh. based on that information. So, exactly. it's, yeah, so it's not, we're not trying to uh, create supercomputers here that take over uh, the exactly. world and security. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, next question. How does low light or foggy conditions impact analytics? Yeah, that's a, a, a great question um, because lighting uh, is is key for for any imaging application with or without uh, analytics. So let's let's tackle the low lighting um, situation first. So low light does impact uh, analytics because um, what you can't see, you can't detect. As we mentioned, even with um, good lighting for standard definition to high definition. So low light definitely is a challenge. So what are the solutions to that? There are a couple of solutions. Um, one is the use of uh, thermal technology. So um, using thermal cameras uh, for extremely low light um, perimeters, for example, is a very common and accepted uh, and, and proven uh, way of uh, uh, still being able to leverage the use of analytics uh, with an imaging technology. So thermal is one. Second is, um, uh, again, the use of uh, a night vision technology, infrared, but near infrared. So infrared illuminators or cameras with infrared uh, that can um, produce a monochrome um, uh, image and has uh, LED uh, infrared that the human eye can't see, but it lights up the area. That's an, ex uh, an excellent way. Now, between thermal and near infrared, there's definitely a difference in terms of distance performance. So thermal tends to be able to see quite far. Uh, near infrared is typically uh, for uh, nearer um, fields of view, um, but there's also a huge difference in cost, so that, that's also uh, one way. So those two are, are great for low light. Now, thermal can also be used in uh, foggy situations. Um, the principles of thermal, because it's detecting heat, um, rather than using the principles of uh, light, um, it can, depending on the thickness of fog, can uh, uh, still see uh, and provide a, a, an image, a uh, thermal image, uh, within a foggy situation. So thermal, again, can be used uh, in that application. So um, uh, that, that's, a, that's a great option. And then uh, one thing that we've seen quite a bit with um, uh, high-definition cameras is through the improvement of overall low-light performance. And, uh, for example, the Vigilant Light Catcher um, camera uh, technology has the ability to, to show uh, great images in color and low light. So uh, if you can't go thermal or infrared, then you have that option. So um, there's, there's quite a few options on the table for, for those applications. Great. Excellent. Um, here's another question. Does the Vigilon have its own advanced analytics greater than basic motion detection, or do you use third-party products? So earlier this year, or I think maybe the last few days of last year, uh, Avigilon acquired a company called Video IQ, and Video IQ's uh, patented uh, pattern matching analytics is, is what we uh, use to provide analytics to customers today. So while all of our cameras have basic uh, motion detection, the pattern 
or uh, advanced pattern-based motion detection is now available. Uh, today we provide that through uh, what we call an analytic appliance, so a device that can connect um, to the camera and, and provide those analytics um, that you know, was covered in the presentation today. Awesome. Excellent. Uh, and uh, questions keep coming in. Next one is, um, are the video events stored for future review, or are they only presenting an alert at the time of the event? So that's a good question. So the idea here isn't to just provide the alert. I mean, the alert allows crime prevention, but obviously um, you still need the evidence there, and, and so it can be used in twofold. So while we talked a lot today about active monitoring or, or manage monitoring by exception, um, that's provided with the device, but we also record that for evidentiary purposes. And so you could use this to uh, optimize the recording. So I'll only record, say, in high definition when um, an analytic or um, uh, event fired. Uh, it could be used that way, or you can record it all. We, we capture, as we, we always say, we're always watching the scene, and we're all, we can always store and capture that information um, and then provide the alerts as an added benefit. Excellent. Uh, let's see. There's another one. Are your analytics server-based, edge-based, or both? Right, that's a good question. So in the market, uh, analytics is sort of seems split. Um, part of the industry is doing it on devices, and part of it provides it through software. We take the approach of running the analytics on the edge device. So in, in this case, um, we're talking about the analytic appliance, um, but again, that's, that's running it closer to the edge and not on the server, and that really helps from a scalability standpoint uh, and allowing, you know, when, that, when it does re reside closer to the edge to be um, something that's a bit more proactive and scales with the deployment, so tying it to the individual channels, but that's a good question. Gotcha. Uh, let's see, I think we have time for a few more here. Um, what sort of hardware is required for each feed, or is this 100% software-based? So it's a little tying on to the last question. So right. in, in our case, uh, we have these Rialto analytic appliances, and they can connect to the camera, and, that, and that's what needed. And depending on the definition of the camera, so if it's uh, 2 megapixel, we can support two on a device or, or it scales up to four, and that depends on the configuration. So we have a few different options there. Um, but it certainly uh, re requires a hardware side. It, and analytics is quite processor intensive, um, so this really allows it to scale. And it, where in software cases it can work quite well when you have a couple events, um, but you can have some scalability challenges um, over the long run if, if you're deploying it broadly. So we've taken a, a hardware approach. Great. Uh, let's see. There's another one. What are the advantages? What are the advantages of Avigilon's new analytic appliance compared to other analytic software? So, in that presentation today, I talked about uh, motion detection, events motion, and then pattern base. Our solution is, is focused around pattern base, and, and we find that. Our uh, false alarm rate is, is considerably lower um, than others that have implemented it. Um, you know, it's pretty common uh, for other vendors to provide um, solutions that are, are very capable, but, but by focusing ours on uh, the low false alarm rate by making it, you know, learning-based, so it's simple to set up an install and then having support for up to two megapixel native. Now, keep in mind, often, You'll see, oh, this is uh, analytics that runs on a high uh, megapixel camera or stream. It's actually down sampling that to SIF or something. And as uh, Will went through, you can see the advantages. So those three points we talked about are really what we think uh, we bring to the market uh, and differentiates how analytics is capable of. So. Exactly. Thank you. Well, this is a topic that's of keen interest to our audience. The uh, questions are coming in fast and furious. Here's another one. Do you think that fiber optic will give better and faster results than copper on surveillance security cameras? Well, um, the, the one thing that fiber definitely provides is um, the advantage of just your, your distance run. So uh, for IP cameras for the standard um, Ethernet run, 
Um, there is a limitation in terms of your distance, so fiber extends that uh, to miles and kilometers worth of, um, of your run. So um, I don't know specifically in terms of the comparison to copper, but uh, fiber definitely becomes uh, an important uh, component of, uh, especially for perimeter security, and when you're putting cameras on a large area and perimeter fiber runs are typically uh, what's, uh, what's leveraged. Okay. Um, what is the maximum resolution camera Vigilon plans on integrating analytics into? Um, what I can talk about today is that um, the analytics, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, does um, uh, do its analysis in high definition up to full HD, which is 1080p. So you'll be able to take a roughly a you know, two megapixel camera and we analyze uh, in that resolution, which is a key differentiator um, to the majority of analytic solutions out there. Now, the beauty of, um, of that is, as we mentioned, is the ability to capture in greater range um, and the accuracy is better. Um, but then you can couple that. So, for example, if you, if you look at a system that would uh, utilize, um, let's say, one or two megapixel cameras um, uh, with the analytics, and then a uh, couple of that are tie in with higher resolution. Uh, Vigilon offers up to 29 megapixel cameras. Um, and be able to then use those cameras for identification purposes. Uh, really ties those together very well. So you analyze up to two megapixel, you get the alert, and then you're able to do identification purposes with uh, higher resolution. That's a, a very powerful combination. Excellent. Well, good, good questions today. But that's about all the time we have for today's live interactive webcast. I want to give a big thanks to our speakers, Saskia Battersby and Willem Ryan of Abba Vigilon, for their expertise and insights. And thanks especially to you, our listeners, for tuning in. Please remember to check out the additional resources tab of your player for links to some valuable Vigilon resources. In addition, all attendees will receive a follow-up mail in the next day or two with a link to the recording of the webcast. For Vigilon and IDG, I'm Tom Schmidt.